And we are back. For some of you, this is hour one. For some of you, for some others, this is hour two. Uh, this is Late Night Parents. This is Ted Hicks. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, under Late Night Parent. Um, you can find me on Twitter as the real Ted Hicks. Our website, latenightparent.com, as we usually do on. You know, at the start of most of our shows, we want to shout out our radio partners, UNR1, Life Improvement, I-95 Sports Network, NGSC Sports, uh, The Under.us, that's The Underground with 9-0, XRP Radio in the UK, The 405 Radio, Arena Sports Network, Imagination U, and more importantly, we have um, our home is the Happy Hour Network. So tonight is a two-hour show. I like to say show. A lot of people say podcast, and I, I kind of have to check myself. But um, kind of, we're kind of splitting this one up. Um, in hour one, we had John Inklandon from Hisamatsu um, America, the parent company of Salon Pass. We had Dan Soderbergh. Dad's Time Out. He co-authored the book Elevator Jones with his nine-year-old son. But hour two, it's going to be a little bit different. It might be a little bit edgy. So we want you to sit back and, and enjoy yourself because we have none other. We have two great guests coming up for this show. We're going to have none other than the legendary C.S. Keys is going to be joining us in the next 90 seconds. We're going to be talking about the Super Bowl or the aftermath of the Super Bowl and a whole range of topics. It's, you know, And then at 30 minutes past the hour, we're going to have Rosalind Ross joining us to talk about the All-Star Game. We're going to talk about a little bit of fitness, binge watching, and Valentine's Day. You, you guys do know, you know Valentine's Day is coming up. Don't come at home empty-handed Sunday. You better do something. And for those of you that um, are single, you know, hey, it's a great day to be out there. You could find Mr. and Mrs. Wright. Keep your head up and keep looking. But without further ado, we're going to bring on uh, Broham number one, (laughs) Mr. (laughs) Broham number one, C.S. Keys. The, I like to say the legendary C.S. Keys. Because, you know, behind What's the scenes, going on with you, Dave? What's to, going on with you, baby? What's up? What's up? What's up, brother? It's good to have you on, man. It's, it's, I, 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 hour one, I had, you know, some corporate people on and people talking about their, their children's book. And I said, when is C.S. coming on? And I kept looking at the clock. <laughs> Kept <laughs> looking at the clock. <laughs> well, well, now, now, now it's going to be a different kind of party. <laughs> it's going to be a different kind of party. Like I said, I was, I was laid back and I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay. But always, you are a friend to the room. Uh, CS, let's let's just get into it. Um, the Super Bowl happened on Sunday. I mean, me personally, I'm an offensive guy. So if you're a defensive guy, you love that Super Bowl. I I can't say I loved it. I was kind of falling asleep, but I, I would say this much. On the edges, you had uh, Ware and you you had um, my other guy. I can't Von Miller. Name, Von Miller. Guy. Oh, mm-hmm. Von Miller. Von right. Miller on the edges, and they, they were polarizing our guy Cam Newton. Well, what, what's your thoughts? Well, you notice what happened. If you notice what happened the week before in New England, uh, they just ate Tom Brady up because that offensive line in New England couldn't handle him. And eventually they ended up getting the offensive line coach fired in New England. Yes. And the Chargers actually picked him up, which we'll get into that later. But uh, as far as <laughs> the Super Bowl is concerned, you're right. It was a defensive game. I played on the defensive side of the ball. So to me it was a good game because it was just hitting you in the mouth left and right, left and right. But there, there was a couple of mistakes that, that were happening because Denver actually allowed Carolina to stay in the game because when you drive down the field and you only settle for field goals instead of touchdowns, right. and I said that's going to right. be an Achilles heel for Denver, but eventually 
Denver pulled it out because Carolina didn't capitalize on their opportunities. Was was it the case that Bum Phillips is the greatest defensive coordinator? I mean, we all know about the great Bum Phillips. I mean, excuse me, wait, I'm getting all names screwed up tonight. Well, that's the son. It's still in the same family. Yeah. Son son of Bum. Son of Bum. Right. right? But (laughs) Wade, Wade Phillips, I mean, is he the greatest DC ever? Or well, you know, you, you would have to aired. you would have to argue that with, with Buddy Ryan because yes. I mean Buddy Ryan what, what he what he developed in the in the four six defense in Chicago and what he did as a head coach in Philadelphia with their defense you know it can't be questioned even when he was in Arizona he still did the defense up so you could you could have the argument with him and Buddy Ryan but uh, Wade tell us what he did in the in the second half of the year with Denver. Uh, it just can't be questioned. And then what you saw on the field, and really you got to give credit to John Elway too, because after they got embarrassed yes. two years ago by Seattle, he said, "Look, <laughs> we got to get strong on defense because they straight got bitch slapped by Seattle yes. on the defensive side of the ball." So he went out. And he got he got where he got T.J. Ward. He got to uh, uh, to, to kill Alib, and really Alib almost lost it. He had three different yeah. dummies in that game that he couldn't look like he was about to go Johnny Manziel on everybody out there. <laughs> but then he, he got it back together, and the, and the next thing you know, they're holding Carolina down. They're rushing uh, Cam Newton. Cam Newton has never seen a defense like that all year long, uh, and they just did what they had to do. You got to give Denver credit. So, I, I you know, CS, I'm going I'm to jump around here. There's a couple of things I want to say to you. Okay, mm-hmm. so Cam Newton is getting – beat up not only in the game but by you know media for not number one i mean that that post game whatever you want to call it was was horrendous but okay so he's been getting beat up all game he had the opportunity to go for that fumble and he said it was a business decision cs i understand i understand where he's coming from he said that his, and if you look at it a couple times, and I looked at the table a couple times, he was saying how his leg was torqued in a different way, which it was. It was it was straight up, straight up and down. And the only thing I can re- equate this to is is Drew Brees in the last game of the season with the San Diego Chargers when he went for a fumble and dislocated his shoulder. That was the catalyst to getting him out of San Diego. So I can understand where Cam is coming from, that his body was contorted in a way where if he went for the ball, he may have injured his knee. I get that. But like he said, and I give him credit for this, that fumble isn't why they lost the game. Even though they were still in the game at 16-10, at that point it was still winnable for them, that fumble isn't why they lost the game. However, I think the thing with Cam, especially getting getting bombasted in, in the media, is not just the fumble, but the way he acted afterwards in the press conference. And what people need yes. to realize is that there was only a couple curtains separating the Carolina Panthers and the Denver Broncos. And you can hear a lot of the Broncos on the other side doing interviews, excited as they should be because they just won the Super Bowl, and it just got to Cam. He started hearing some of the comments, and then some of the questions <laughs> that the reporters were asking him were straight ass. I mean, I mean, if you're going to ask a question, <laughs> ask something that, that's meaningful. So he, it got on his nerves, but he needs to realize – he can't act like that. He acted like a little baby. He acted like a little kid. You know, I'm going to take my ball home because y'all won't play with me. You can't do that. Russell Wilson last year was one yard away from getting his second yes. Super Bowl ring through an interception. He stood there after the game, answered every – for 40 minutes, answered every <laughs> question like a professional. Cam, it was a bad look on him. You just got voted MVP of the league. You're just about to be the, the, the face of the league. You got advertisers out the out the butt, and I'm sure a couple of his his representatives, or I should call them handlers, came to him later and said, "Look, you can't do this. You got guys right now paying you money to advertise their their products, yogurt, and all this other kind of stuff. If you're gonna be Superman, you can't be super bitch later on when you start crying. Face up to it." I I, I you know CS, you had you had so many great points. I'm gonna say this much: um, Peyton Manning, twelve billion dollars in endorsements. Cam Newton, $11 million in endorsements. So he's right there. Like you said, face of the NFL, he's the MVP. He's going to be on Madden again. He's that guy. So, yes, you're not going to – I mean, and, and I think the main thing here is when you look at the mainstream media and he's dabbing from week one, they're taking pictures before the games are even over, team pictures. They've got mm-hmm. baseball bats out there. They've got all different types of 
distractions going on out there. And when the goings are good, everyone's out there smiling and cheesing and, 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 and living it up. But when, right. when, when things go bad, it's something else. It goes back to the old Cam from a few years ago. Now, so, he's always been keep... like this. It was oh, brought okay. to my attention that even, even in college, he was like this. Now, the comments he made this week talking about he's always been a sore loser, and if you don't mind, if you if you enjoy losing, then you are a loser. <laughs> I get that. You okay? are a loser. You are a loser. But the thing about the, about the dabbing and all that, to be honest with you, like Ron Rivera said, those guys have been doing that for, for, for the last three, four years. It's just that when right. you start the season at 14-0, and 0, now you've got a whole right. bunch of eyeballs on you. You've got so many people looking at you. So so many people nationally haven't seen that. So they look at it as, as happening just now. They've been doing that for the last three or four years, but now people are looking at them. And they'll continue to do that. Right. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with that. It's personality. It's expressing themselves. And for a head coach like Ron Rivera, he goes ahead and encourages that because he was on the 85 Bears team who had more personalities than anybody that you know. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, we gotta we gotta touch we we have to touch race, and I guess we have to touch race because we're both African American. Um, we've seen the flip side to it. We've seen Johnny Menzel spin out of control, and yes, the media is getting at him, but to a much lesser degree than Cam not answering questions. And we're seeing him totally torn apart by the media. And and and, and for some reason, you know, you, you've got so many different people say, oh, it's not about race. It, it's always about race. It always but is. Yes, the, it is. The, yes, it is. The, the, the question I have for you is Cam's actions after the game, did that set the black quarterback back? I don't know if it if it set the black quarterback back because you can't you can't take away his accomplishments this year. You can't take away seventeen and one now seventeen and two. You can't take away the MVP award. Uh, you can't take away who he is six five six six two hundred forty two hundred forty five pounds. Uh, you have never seen a freak nature like this under center at all. Uh, so it doesn't take that away, and I don't think it takes away from the black quarterback unless you're one of them hooded white folks down south who just want to use an excuse <laughs> to talk some smack. Right. But on, on, right. it just it took away from him for a little bit because he was riding a good ride with that smile, with that personality, you know, doing the dab. When I saw a tweet of these six little white old white ladies doing dabs, I'm like, yeah, he don't make the crossover. And ain't nothing wrong with yeah. that. Ain't nothing <laughs> wrong with that. But I don't think it took away from him as a black quarterback because I'm I'm hoping that we're getting away from the conversation of a black and white right. quarterback instead of him just being a quarterback. But it amazes me how – Aaron Rodgers can do, you know, the, the the belt dance when he gets a touchdown and he gets a multi million dollar deal with a State Farm. Cad does a couple right. of dads and the Superman thing and everybody wants to go crazy. And really no one's talking about it. But after the game, the interview with, with Peyton Manning, which was all great. I'm glad he got a second ring. But the interview with Peyton Manning, a lot of people don't realize he owns two different beer distributors. He mentioned Budweiser, which is the distributor he owns. And legally the, the athletes in the NFL are not supposed to promote beer pro- alcohol I heard products. That. He did, yeah, he did it on, on the slide. And I give Peyton credit. That was some brother stuff right there. You know, you just slide it on in there. Real good. I'm going to get me a lot of Budweiser beer, you know. So, but no one's talking about that. But, you know, congratulations to him, though. Oh, my goodness. So, so I, I got to take a step back where you can see everyone in the locker room supports Cam. And last year, we, we turned the clock back a year. It didn't seem that that didn't seem to be the case with Russell Wilson because here's the other side of and I hate to say it the black quarterback. I mean, mm-hmm. very they need to just be quarterbacks, but right Russell Wilson is different. You know, he's out there. Well, he's not really that much different because Kim is involved with the community. Russell Wilson is involved with the community, but Russell Wilson is seemed, you know, or, or the, the perception is he's corporate. Perception is, you know, you, you ask some of the African-American players, they're like, oh, well, he's corporate or he's acting white. When do we get past that point, CS? Well, I, I, think, I think there's always going to be inner fighting between us as a people. Uh, it's always been that way. 
uh, it wasn't just the white folks that that brought us over here and changed. Some of the brothers over in Africa helped them chain us up. So it's always been that inner fighting that's going on. Uh, As far as Russell's concerned, see, I I see him, you know, with with the clean-cut look. I see him with the proper answers and things of this manner. But he also did some brother stuff. I could call it a different thing, but we on your show. I'm not going to do that. But he did some brother (laughs) stuff when his his white fiancé started going out spending his money and dropping his name. He cut her ass real quick and got with Sierra. So that's some brother stuff right there. So he ain't but so corporate. He came back to his roots and did his thing. But I I think, uh, you know, Richard Sherman kind of cleared it up himself, saying that, you know, there was no animosity in the locker room. Somebody, you know, let something out that was a misunderstanding, which can happen. And then, of course, as you know, the media, you know, they, they take off and run with it. So you're in a – you have a unique perspective, C.S., because you're out in the West Coast. You're, you're, you're a legend, but you're in San Diego, but you're a Raiders fan. Because I see you always rocking your Raiders cap. Damn and right. There was so much. There was so many discussions about relocation. And after Stan Kroenke basically took his team, bought his land, and said, "Hey, I'm taking these guys on out of here legally. I can do it because I can because I, I have billions of dollars." It, the situation was different for San Diego and and for Oakland. And they're kind of circling the wagon, going back and forth, and, you know, public versus private dollars. And what's your take on relocation out there out west with you? You know, sometimes you don't want to say I told you so to people, but I'm going to say, damn it, I told you so. About a year and a half ago, when all this started coming up, there, a lot of people don't realize there was like a little vote in L.A. I don't know whether it was city council or the chamber of commerce, wherever the case may be. They said the number one team that they wanted back in L.A. was the Rams because the Rams were okay. there. I get that. And the second team they wanted was the Raiders. There was not one vote for the San Diego Chargers. And I said that back in the day. And I told people this past season, you have to be wanted to go somewhere. Don't nobody want these damn lightning strikes. Fourteen, Four and 12? What kind of product are you taking anywhere? You can't take that product nowhere. You better stay right where you at and get a get a stadium taken care of here. Now on the Chargers uh, for the Chargers support, I've been here in San Diego going on 16 years. They've been talking about a stadium for 14 years and they still ain't got it done. Wow. So some of the blame is on Spanos as the owners, and some of the blame is on 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 the city council and the mayors, the different mayors here in San Diego. I think now they're going to get a, a deal done. They have to now because the Chargers have been cleared to go to L.A with Kroenke and the Rams, but why would you want to go be a stepchild somewhere where you can be the big brother right. in your own city? It, it makes no sense. And, they, and you know, and, and Dean Spanos, the president of the Char- owner of the Chargers, said 25% of his business is in the L.A. market. the hell he talking about? Now, L.A. comes down here to see the Raiders. I heard L.A. fans who are right there, or San Diego Charger fans who are in L.A. said they wouldn't even go to the game in L.A., but they had no problem coming to San Diego to see the Chargers. <laughs> San Diego and L.A. always have been a, a, a brother, stepbrother kind of uh, relationship the whole time I've been here. The Chargers aren't going nowhere. They don't want the Raiders to be in L.A. because, to be honest with you, the Raiders will have a bigger fan base than the Rams do. When the Raiders were down wow. in L.A., they won a championship. So if the Raiders come back to L.A., it's home already. So Kroenke doesn't want uh, Davis, Mark Davis and the Raiders there because they're going to be a bigger attraction than the Rams will be. So the Rams will get their deal. They got it already. And Kroenke's going to build a hell of a stadium. It's going to be, a, you know, a Disney amusement park there, you know, second to Jerry's World, even better than Jerry's right. World. The Raiders right. will get their deal in Oakland because they belong in Oakland. And San Diego will be right here in San Diego bullshitting, not doing nothing, and putting a, a mediocre team on the field, and they'll get their stadium too. You know, I mean, here's what's crazy, and, and I understand, or maybe, you know what, I don't understand because I'm not a billionaire, um, but the fact that some of these billionaires are, are looking for public funding mm-hmm. is just mm-hmm. incredible to me because mm-hmm. I, I saw it out here on Long Island with um, the Islanders. So I'm Mm -hmm. maybe a mile and a half from where the Islanders used to play at Nassau Coliseum. Great. I mean, it it was, it was a crappy stadium. It's been around for 42 years, Uh but it was somewhere where I could, I could, I could take my son. We can go, whether it's a wrestling match or this or that, whatever, whatever the, you know, the show was when we enjoyed ourselves, but we got to the point where 
you know, we, we had the opportunity to vote. Hey, your taxes mm-hmm. are going to go up $58 extra per year. And, of course, you know with taxes, things only, only, only go up. They only increase. They to, never go down. To, That's right. To fund, right. To, to fund the stadium. You know, I had to vote no. And now that stadium, you know, the team is in Brooklyn. And I've yet to, to go to Barclays Center. Nothing against it, but I'm just like, well, hey, this was the team. This was here for 40-plus years, and they couldn't get it right. Politicians, you know, everyone's dirty. It's just – I'm just – it's still in awe by the fact that these billionaires are asking for public dollars. It's, it's well, To me, it's is, just you, a total change. you got to remember, too, the NFL is a pimp. The NFL yes. is just a, a multibillion-dollar business that continues to grow, continues to get bigger. Nothing – can put a stain on the NFL, the concussion controversy, which is going to be there, and it's true, the domestic violence controversy, which really we're only talking about a microcosm of the world because NFL players don't make up the entire world. They reflect what's already in the world. Anything that goes on in the NFL is just like a fly on your shoulder. You flick it off, and they keep making money, keep building. And if they ask for something, it is 32 teams in the league. You will be blessed to have – now, you're blessed because you've got two teams in your area, but you will be blessed right. to have a team in your city. So when it comes down to asking for this and asking for that, and, and of course, they're contributing some money too, it's going to get done. Well, you're right. You're right. Um, there's so many different topics to, to cover with you. Um, hey, so does Goodell, he's, he's had some missteps in the past 18 months or so. Um is he still here to stay? Is should he be concerned about anything? Um, what's he, your he, thoughts on Roger Goodell? He ain't got nothing to be concerned about when you're making forty-four million dollars a year and the <laughs> owners are paying you to do to do and say what they want you to do and say. He's good to go, and, and until he wants to go like Pete Rozell, until he wants to go and, and anoint somebody else, which Pete anointed Roger Goodell, uh, Roger Goodell is going to be right there. Yeah, he's 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 had some missteps in the public, and he's mishandled some things. This is true. But he's not going nowhere because all the owners, and in fact, from my understanding, a good percentage of them support him because basically they pay him. He does what they want him to do, and he does what they, they tell him to do. That don't, don't get it twisted. You may be the commissioner of the NFL, but you are being paid by the 32 owners of the league. He ain't going nowhere. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, real quick question on Peyton Manning, his, his next steps. Do you think – Getting pimped out, you know, it, it seems like there's pieces of tape, duct tape holding him together. But do you think you see him in some uniform next season, or do you see him no. as someone's team president, or do you see him as, you know, on NBC or or the Four Letter Network, or what do you see? You know, I, he at? might he might he might make an appearance or two on TV, but I don't think his personality is one that lends to be um, – I mean, it's, not, it's nothing against him. He's just dry. Uh, he does have a dry sense of humor. It comes across sometimes when he gets on Saturday Night Live, and it can be funny. I've seen some of the clips on YouTube. It could be funny. But as far as an analyst is concerned or a color analyst, I just thought, I, he reminds me of Joe Montana. Joe Montana took a stab at it, and he was terrible. So then he just went off and t- t- took care of his businesses. Peyton, you know, he, he's invested a lot in different businesses. he got about 17 million Papa John's there in the Colorado area. Uh, and, you know, he got the beer distributors, and he got some other stuff going on. You know, Nationwide's got him on their hook. But I think I, I think he's done. Uh, I think he knows he's done. Uh, he's a, even hinted to it to a couple of people. And it's, it's basically a Hollywood story. I mean, it, nobody expected him to come back this year. And then, of course, he sat out for seven or eight games. And even when he sat out for seven or eight games, he still led the league in interceptions. Uh, he just can't do what he used to do. And you, you don't want to see somebody continue to play when your body will not do what your mind wants it to do. He's done, and he had a great story going out on the Super Bowl championship win, just like his uh, president and CEO, um, uh, John Elway. And they did it for their owner, Pat Bowling, which was another, you know, kind of tear tearjerker, heart jerker story because, uh, you know, Pat did it for, for John when John won. Now John did it for Pat when he's uh, unfortunately got uh, uh, old time. I was going to say old timers. That's what my uncle calls it, old timers. And, uh, you know, not really in good health. But it, it's a good Hollywood story, gotcha. so he's done. He's done. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I, I, I want to spend the final couple minutes on what's going on with the legendary CS Keys. I love listening to the show. I, I would always tune in on, on Saturdays. 
I know you're retooling it and, and things like that. I just got to put it out there because I'm opening, I mean, openly petitioning to get you on this network. But well, I, I appreciate it, buddy. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we, there, there has to be some discussions to go behind the scenes, but what's so what's going on in your world? What's what's happening yeah, with you? I appreciate that comment, man. You and my mom said it, so that's two people. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the show went on a went on a little hiatus in August, and uh, we were basically putting some things together. Sponsorship is one of the big hangups, so you know until we get all that taken care of. But we will be back on there. I'm gonna be like Ray Charles. I'm gonna make it do what it do, baby. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Hey, um, any quick thoughts on the, the one NBA question I'm going to ask you? Mm-hmm. I mean, the entire world is in love with Steph Curry, and everyone is now a Golden State Warrior fan. Will they meet or break that 72 and 10 record from the Chicago Bulls? Ah, oh, man, that is a that is ah. Uh. That's a good question, Ted, because it has kind of got me torn because I love what uh, what Steve Kerr has done with that team, a la uh, Jackson, because that was Mark Jackson's team. And, uh, yes. and I, I got to say, even 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 Luke Walton has done a great job, you know, sitting in for Steve Kerr. But that's Mark Jackson's team. But Steve Kerr is there, so he's done a great job. They got a championship. Glad for the folks in the Oakland area because it's been so long. I'm talking about decades and decades. And everybody, yes, yeah, Stephen Curry is just he's just the he's the love of everybody right now, and he, and he should be. That boy is balling. <laughs> That boy is balling, man. I see him before the game shooting stuff in the tunnel going straight net. I see him during the game just rising up on people and just, boom, straight net, walking down. The, he, he'll shoot it and turn around and start walking, not even know and that's going in, but it went in. But Steph is the man, and the Warriors are doing what they got to do. But being a Michael Jordan fan, being a fan of yes. that era and watching that team do what they did, um, if it happens, it happens. But I would have to – if I have, if you're going to put my feet to the fire – I'm going to say, no, it's not going to happen. I'll let the Bulls hang on to that record, but the Warriors will still be up in the up in the talk of one of the greatest teams at this point. They may, I, I think they're going to fall short. They're not going to get that record, but they'll be close to it. Hey, I want to make this one last statement for you. The, the one last statement is David Blatt was kicked to the curb, and LeBron James knew nothing about it. He knew nothing at all, CS, and I wish I had – the wave file for the X Files music, because <laughs> real quickly, what let me say something. Let me say Black? something. If 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 you if you think LeBron didn't know what the hell was going on, or if you think he wasn't consulted about it, then you know what? I got some land to sell you in Long Island that that's near a swamp. Let me tell you something right now. LeBron never wanted Black there. He, he never had no co- head coaching experience. Black didn't take them to the to the to the finals. LeBron took them to the finals. When you look at some of that footage of him pushing Black away and changing, and he even said himself he would change plays. He didn't want him there. Everybody likes Teron Lou, especially LeBron. And Teron was on to come up anyway. Now some people or some coaches or whatever will you know kind of look at him in a negative way because the route that he took to get it. But then again, the players won him, and he is a good up and coming head coach. But if you think that LeBron had nothing to do with Black. Getting pushed out of there, man, please. He knew everything going on. CS, I want to give you a round of applause. <laughs> you know, I always tell, enjoy tell it, my man. Anytime you, anytime you need me, just give me a call. I appreciate you. No doubt, no doubt. Listen, tell us best ways to get in contact with you via social media. Oh, you can follow me on, on uh, Twitter and Instagram, same address, at CS Key Show. Very simple. Gotcha. CS, we're definitely going to be talking offline because, like I said, there's a spot on this network waiting for you. We, we need you. you. You're the legend. We're going to keep the conversation open, and I better see my Twitter and <laughs> Instagram followers rise up after I get off your show. <laughs> you got it, brother. Take care. All right. You got it, Ted. Thank you. And that was CS Keys. We covered the Super Bowl. We covered relocation. We covered Cam Newton. We talked a little race. I'm sorry, folks. We had to talk race. We did. Okay. I'm really not sorry because, you know, hey, it's, it's a discussion that has to go on. But 
with that, before we bring our last but not least, the lovely Roslyn Ross on the show, we've got to take a quick break. I've got to plug our good friends and sponsors of the show, Audible. And I also have my Black History Month shout out. I'm going to play that again for the second hour right now. So we got a Black History Month, our shout out, and then we're going to play an Audible um, promo. And then the next voice you'll hear after mine will be Rosalind Ross. Check this out. This is Ted Hicks from Late Night Parents. And we wanted to let you know about Black History Month. February is Black History Month, but we like to say every single month is Black History Month. We should recognize the rich culture and heritage of black people. And although the battles have not been won yet, we should be proud to take some time out this month to explore the powerful and victorious lineage of our people. That's right. So don't be a vulture and learn about your culture. Uh, Late Night Parents salutes the history of black people and the history that we have yet to make. That's right. And it's not a mistake. Now back to the live show. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook of your choice and a free 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash late night parents and choose from over 180,000 audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash late night parents. That's audibletrial.com slash late night parents and get started today. Why Audible? Audible content includes more than 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. That's audibletrials.com slash late night parents. And we are back. We're live. This is the last segment number four of the show or, or the podcast for Late Night Parents. I am Ted Hicks, once again, coming to you. And we want to thank everyone that was on the show previously. Various, you know, the guests, they, they vary from week to week. want to thank all the PR teams that help us out each week with offering up inventors and, 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 and authors and people that just, you know, parents, dads, moms, people that want to talk about, you know, teachers, lawyers, doctors. Um, and every once in a while we have a, you know, a startup CEO or a, a tech CEO from Silicon Valley. Um, and, of course, the people that bring their products here or send them to, to my home to you know, test out their products and, and write a review about it. So we appreciate you guys. <clears throat> but without further ado, there was no PR person that was able to get this star. This is the A-list star that we have on the line right now. I hope she's smiling. Roz, Roz how you doing? <laughs> I'm definitely smiling. <laughs> you are too kind. I'm well. How are you? <laughs> doing well, doing well is I mean, a couple in a few days, it's Valentine's Day. I got to put you, I mean, you're a friend to the room, a friend to our listeners, <laughs> the people that, that, that go to the Facebook page. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, well, Russ, tell us, you know, who you are and everything. Everyone knows. Um, <laughs> Russ, got to ask you. Got to ask you. What, and, and I got to put you on the spot. So right out the gate, we're not talking NBA or anything else like that. What did you tell hubby to get you for Valentine's Day? Or did you have to tell him? And, you know, so what are your expectations for Valentine's Day? Honestly, I didn't tell. I mean, I just told him I don't, you know, I hate to be this person, but I don't care, really. I mean, this isn't one of my days. You know what I mean? So I hope that, so I'll be honest and say, I hope that, you know, he – thinks of something very minor and easy just to acknowledge um, the day, I guess. And I'll do the same for him. But, you know, we try not to put a lot of pressure on ourselves for, um, you know, for Valentine's Day just because such a big deal is made out of it. And, you know, that kind of pressure along with all the other stuff that you have to deal with is unnecessary. So we'll probably go and hold down a bar somewhere, like go and hang out and, spend several hours laughing with other couples at a bar and eat good and, and have a good night. That's what I'm looking forward to. 
Perfect. Perfect, perfect. You probably yeah, made all the dads. Yeah, easy like Sunday morning. That, easy stuff. <laughs> you probably made all the dads are just smiling right now. The dads are, that are going to listen to this tomorrow, um, you know, to most of well, our Well, don't, don't take my advice gotta, now. I'm not giving out advice. That's not advice because I don't know. Some, you know, these women work hard and they do they do a great job um, holding down the fort and taking care of families. So, some of some of us would like a little more. It just so happens that I, you know, I feel loved every day, and I, you know, I like to make it easy. Now, if you have this conversation with me in August around my birthday, <laughs> and ask me, <laughs> and ask me what I have requested, it'll probably be a, a little bit longer of a list. But this one, we're gonna take it easy. Okay, okay, that's no, that's fair. And I gotta tell you, I'm talking low because my wife is in the next room. <laughs> And she put on the refrigerator a Burberry jacket, you know, like a Ooh, promo. Nice. So it it actually came in yesterday. So Me I yay. hid it in my closet. I hid it in the closet, and I said. Oh, and trust me, you she better wear this from now until summertime. I'm sure. Every day. <laughs> I'm sure. It can never go out of style, right? It has to be in style every day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my goodness. I gotta so so from switching to, to Valentine I mean, and what you just said was so profound, I gotta tell you, because you know, I, I I'm thinking if you are with your significant other, you know, yes, Valentine's Day is something, but all during the year. It's kind of like what I tell my kids. I'm like, every day is Christmas too for you guys. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and, and, and it's like I program them to to yeah. the point where my 14-year-old says, well, hey, if I want something, all I got to do is ask dad, or ask dad or mom, and, you know, it just magically appears. And I'm like, well, it just doesn't magically appear. Magically, but... exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm sure you would agree. I mean, the one thing that I would caution people against, Ted, and I'm sure you agree with me here, is – this this sort of you want something, but you don't want to articulate it at all, right? And you want to put right. your significant other, your spouse, through this whole game of trying to figure it out, and that puts a lot of pressure on them. So whether you go big or small with the gift, I would just say be willing to – nobody can read your mind, you know what I mean? So be right. willing to give some hints or something, but don't say, well, you ought to know what I want, and then you get right. mad when it's the wrong thing. <laughs> Right, right, right. I gotta tell you, I, I, I gotta switch subjects, and I gotta be truthful with you. And, and I'm not happy about this, Roz. Okay. You came on the sh- you came on the podcast last year, and we were talking fitness and everything else like that. Don't you know? By March, I I canceled my gym membership, and it was just like, oh, the heck with this. No. <laughs> Well, what did you have? How is it going this year? Did you start this year? Tell me the truth. I I have not started, but I'm thinking about starting as in right in the middle of the beer and the wings that I was consuming (laughs) watching the Super Bowl. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But I want to let you know because I have you down here for we're going to mention something about fitness. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to be truthful and tell you that, yeah, I, I told them, you know what, guys, this worked out well in January of 15, and I was going, and, and, and you know, come February 1, it was just like, boo-boo, boo-boo. Yeah. I just stopped playing. <laughs> well, and that, so, I mean, that's the thing. It's really tricky. You know, you have to be really, really, really patient with yourself when you're trying to start a fitness regimen. I mean, because – it's really easy to get irritated and decide you're going to give up half the way, you know, part of the way through. So you have to be patient and you have to be honest about what you can really do because people get so hyped up, you know, especially at the beginning of the year, you know, especially all this, this stuff about winter, but, you know, summer bodies are created in the winter. So January is high time for people to start obsessing about getting in shape. And so what happens is people normally overcommit to, Oprah commit fitness in their schedule. Like a woman just came to one of my classes two Sundays ago, and she's like, you know, I've decided you're going to be my sixth workout um, workout day of the week. Like I'm going to do a workout wow. for you, and it'll be my. And I'm just sitting there looking at her like, by March, you probably will not be. You'll probably be out of the gym completely. Nobody is going to work out six days a week unless 
they are actually someone who teaches fitness classes, right, or someone who's going to a, you know, they're in a weightlifting, <laughs> some sort of weightlifting contest. Most regular people don't have, people who work jobs, people who have families, most of us don't have time to no. get an hour, like to go to a gym, do an hour's workout, and then drive home from the gym. So that might be, from in most cases, that could be an hour, 15, hour, and 30 minutes total round trip. Most of us have right. a hard time fitting that in their schedule six days a week. So be reasonable with your fitness plans. I will say that in honor of Ted, who abandoned his last year and who's planning <laughs> for his new year. So you're off the I hook, got, got, though. You know, just, yeah, you're off the hook. Just plan to be reasonable and say, can I do this two days a week? Can I do it three days a week, maybe? And then see what happens. Right. Right. No, I think that's fair. I think that's fair because – I, so I live on Long Island, and, but I work in downtown by the World Trade Center. So yeah. giving that the proximity is about maybe 50 or so miles. And yeah, I got to exactly. tell you, you know, I commute. So I go from Long Island Railroad to Subway, and then I walk like, you know, three or four blocks. And, and they're quick blocks, so it's like a brisk walk. But I got to tell sure. you, my commute, my commute is upward of three, three hours to about three hours and 20 minutes a day. I'm sure. That's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's just the commute. So, and this is not my excuse, but yeah, it's my excuse. So by the time I get home, I'm like, man, I'm tired. Exactly. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with this. But I know, like you said, you got to go at least three times a day. And Roz, I got to do something. I, I'm going to get motivated. You have motivated me tonight. <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> I like to I like to help put people's minds at ease that you know what you don't have to go hammer whammer you know what I mean you don't have to say I'm going to do this six days and then as soon as you miss a day you're disappointed and then you say forget the whole thing no just ease your way into it be patient and ease your way into it and then it'll become then you can work it into an actual routine but when you come out of the gate and you're like yes you're so fired up and you think you're going to be able to work out seven <laughs> days a week six days a week no way that's happening no way. Not, not, not unless at you all. Start, not unless you become a bodybuilder, and it, it you have to right. do it. And then you probably won't have a job, and then you can do it all day. But most people can't work out all day. <laughs> right. And and like like exactly. I said, if you if you're not if you're not working, or you have that flexibility where you you have that time, that heck, you have no excuse. But I exactly. mean, you really do have no excuse all, overall. But hey, I got to ask you a question. Um, and, and I'm still, still talking about it. The podcast you, G. Stelio, and, and EJ had last Friday had me in stitches at 1 o'clock yeah, in the morning. So <laughs> did not want you to think I was just like a total psycho. But I'm listening to the podcast because I'm, I was up and I was doing things. I had just came in and I, I just turned it on and I was sitting, sitting and standing there laughing. You guys, yeah, those guys are crazy. I mean, and we're crazy when really we are. get together. <laughs> oh my goodness! But my next question for you is: What are you binge watching? Like, for someone that's as busy as you are, I'm guessing you don't have the time to sit and watch a specific show when the sh- that you know the specific show is programmed to come on. What's in your queue right yeah. now? Um, you know what? I just um. I'm trying to think of what we just finished up or what what I just started. You know, I'm I just started a very weird little show um on TBS which is called Angie Tri- Tribeca. Have you are you okay. familiar with the show at all? Um Dion Not Cole at all. was in it, the guy who used to be on yeah. Dion Cole is in it, the guy who used to be on Blackish. In fact he left Blackish because of this show. And um Oh, okay. And um, why can't I think of uh, Rashida Jones, who was on Community and oh, okay. was on The Office? Like she's the lead person, yes. and it's it's a comedy show done in the vein of it's like a comedy cop series done in the vein of um of like those old Naked Gun movies, an airplane, you know those that just over the top crazy silliness, dumb jokes. 
And it's done just like that. Um, and actually, TBS released it as a binge. Like, they actually gave you 24 hours of the show, showed you every single episode Perfect. in one day. And I didn't watch it that day, of course, but I actually just recently read some reviews on it and decided to to start watching it. So I just started watching it this week, and it's not for everybody at all because it's not real highbrow comedy. It's like the dumbest thing ever but it's so dumb that after like three or four of those dumb jokes back to back you're laughing uncontrollably because you're just like what the heck am i watching so 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 far i've enjoyed it um but and i I know you heard us talking about this on the podcast which is how just how amazing regular you know i don't want to say regular tv but how amazing tv has become you know you used to be we used to obsess about movies all the time but Network television, you know, some of these networks, FX, TBS, um, you know, then on cable, Showtime, HBO, these folks have really stepped up their game with their program, well, yes, which, you know, for my other for my other job, which is, a, is an actress, to see all this opportunity to be on shows and to be a part of um, these casts is really cool. But just in general, it's like quality TV is back. So hopefully it's around for a little while. I enjoyed a lot of series. I enjoyed a lot of stuff this year that I actually didn't have to binge watch. Um, I enjoyed Fargo. I enjoyed. We we were talking about this this O.J. Simpson trial show, right? <laughs> which was kind right. of weird last night. Um, the second episode came on last night, but so far it's it's pretty good. Um, one of the things I was saying on the podcast is there's no way like American Horror Story. My husband and I tried to binge watch that, and the show is so, like, very scary and intense that literally after – we watched a whole season and tried to watch, like, a half of another and, you know, woke up the next morning looking like, okay, is is there going to be a demon outside of our house? I mean, it's just that. (laughs) that, Seriously, it's not really scary, but it's like, what the heck is happening? Like, is there an alternate universe where all of these bad things happen all day, every day? And hopefully I didn't fall into that place when I went to sleep. So we actually abandoned that show, and I hate it because it was really good, but there's just no way to binge watch it because it's too much coming at you all back to back at one time. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the NBA. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the All-Star game. Um, You know what? We won't even talk about the All-Star game. I just want to bring up one NBA topic for you. That mess that's (laughs) going on in New York, that mess that's going on in New York, well, the the Fisher King is gone, Derek Fisher. uh, You know, to me, it was a big joke. The organization itself is a big joke. Carmelo with, you know, knee problems that we knew that yeah. problems existed from way, way back when. You know, the fact that he, he can barely play a regular game, but he's going to, you know, be showboating in the All-Star game. What, what is your take on yeah. this? Well, I, you know, the Derek Fisher hire to me was – you know, a, a strange hire, and and it was it was actually a hire that made that exposed my hypocrisy, right? Because I'm always saying how these organizations love to recycle these old coaches, most of whom, you know, there's not a diverse crowd of them, right? It's getting better, of course. Certainly in the NBA, it's much better, but usually when they recycle a guy, he's you know, there's no diversity there. And it's a guy that really never really did anything, never won a championship. He's just getting another shot. Then when they make a hire like a Derek Fisher or a Teron Liu, then I'm I'm complaining because I think they need more somebody with more experience. But certainly with a franchise like the Knicks, I would think that, you know, that's that's still a very high profile organization in the league. It's a legacy it's a legacy organization. I thought the hire should have been somebody who probably would have been more prepared to handle the media and more prepared to ha- handle, you know, any craziness that would happen, which actually <laughs> Derek Fisher was a part of some craziness that happened. So, um, which, you know, we're a kindred spirits in that because it happened with one of the guys um, down here for the Grizzlies, yes. Matt Barnes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Crazy and Matt Barnes. Crazy Matt Barnes, 
who you know who is unapologetically crazy but um you know one of the things that came out over the last week is uh from Wojo over at, at Yahoo he mentioned how in a piece how you know uh, that kind of sealed the deal with Derek Fisher because he was actually acting like a player he flies out to visit his girlfriend in the middle of training camp gets into a fisticuff right. basically comes back miss it and he doesn't get back in time to coach his team in training camp. I mean, these are things that you expect out of your players. You don't expect it out of a coach. And I would right. imagine he lost teams' respect after that. The whole, and, you know, that's my highbrow analysis. My lowbrow analysis is, you know, how do you trust the dude that's trying to sleep with some one of his friends' exes? Like, how do you how do you respect that guy? And then when he's not uh-huh. acting any more like an adult than – than you are, and you're supposed to be reporting to him, and he's supposed to be leading you and guiding you. It just seemed like it was a disaster on the, you know, on the horizon. It turned out to be that. Now I've I've read that, you know, that Phil Jackson is really going to try to make his way out of the organization as well, and and let it be great on its own without him. And that probably, Ted, is the moment when I'm going to say it's a big heaping whopping mess. Right now, it just feels like right. you need a coach. You need somebody that's going to stabilize the organization. You got a great situation, Porzingis. Carmelo is aging. We knew it was going to happen. It's hard for him to recover from all these injuries. But as far as the team dynamics and what can happen, I really don't feel like you're that far away, especially in the Eastern Conference. But if this whole hoopla behind hiring Phil Jackson then crashes and burns, then right. it's going to be a problem because he hired Derek Fisher – he wanted to install mm-hmm. the triangle offense, and so now you will have spent the your organization will have spent the last two years trying to do all the things that Phil wanted, and then he'll be gone, and that's gonna suck royally. So, I you know I hope that he doesn't leave you guys high and dry, because that to me is gonna be the signal that things are really, really, really out of control. But right now I'm like, okay, if you get a pretty good coach and you can add maybe a couple of pieces, you can you can look pretty much like a stable, you know, team that's on the rise in the East. But you can't do it when your coach is – it doesn't have any respect from his team. And, and that's the impression I see I got from what Wojo said and, and just from my own personal opinion. How do you respect a guy that ends up in a situation like that? Right. Hey, I got to ask you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Roz, but, of course, I, I mean to put you on the spot. When, when does Becky Hammond get a – when does Becky Hammond get a, a full-time coaching position with the NBA? I, I don't know. Um, I, you mean a full – and I assume you mean a full-time head coaching position, right? Head coach. Head, head coach position. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if we're that far along. I just got to be honest with you. I'm not sure that we are that far along. Those guys are t- – I mean, you know, so think about what just happened with Derek Fisher, right? Think about mm-hmm. how fragile it is to maintain the respect of these grown men. Um, I, I think – I just don't know that we're there yet um, as it relates to her getting a head coaching job. I don't know that people have the confidence that – that's a move that needs to be made. But I like that she's in the position. Uh, she's yes. already broken one bar- barrier. And I like the, that she's in the position to go further and to open the doors, you know, for more female head coaching opportunities to happen in the NBA. You know, and we just saw, I just saw a note where a woman was hired as a high, I mean, as a football coach down in, in Miami. So, Yes. You know, you're starting to you're starting to find that type of progression, um, and you just you just hope it continues. I mean, fingers crossed. The one thing that is very intriguing about the NBA opportunities is the fact that there's the WNBA still, right? right. So, mm-hmm. a lot of times you hear you hear women aspiring to. Um, be a head coach in the NBA, which sometimes feels to me that missive to the WNBA. You know what I mean? Like, gotcha. I remember gotcha. when Brittany Griner was getting ready to come out, she wanted to, she talked more, she talked a lot about being drafted in the NBA. And I'm like, well, you're going to be the number one pick in the WNBA. So don't dismiss that opportunity 
It's like we're still right. trying to catch up with the boys. So we have to be we have to be aware of that and be cognizant of that. But you know, I'm I'm glad someone's finally in a in a position to break through. Raj, we have slightly over four minutes, and I gotta really get up to speed with you and find out what's going on in the world of Rosalind Ross. <laughs> well, I have when I get off the phone with you, I gotta go uh, and get ready. I have an audition tomorrow um, for a series that's shooting here in Memphis in mid March. Um, that's actually going to tell the story of the early days of Sun Studios, where, where Elvis started and the whole thing. I mean, you know, Memphis has got a very rich um, yes. Memphis tradition. So I'm looking forward to that. I knew that there was going to be uh, a, a show shooting here, and it's, you know, it's one of those things where as an actress you want to be a part of what that whatever's coming to town, not always having to leave town to find stuff. So I'm excited about this audition tomorrow, so I'm going to spend some more time getting ready for that. Then, actually, tomorrow I have a luncheon where I'm going to get a chance to meet uh, Nancy Kerrigan, which is very cool. Uh, oh, okay. The Open is going on this week, and, and she'll be here, and she's a speaker at that luncheon, which I'm, you know, it's an interesting correlation, but they made it happen, so I'm looking forward to it. But just in general, you know, this is going to be, this is it, this is already starting out as a year that um, seems like it, it'll be a big step in my acting career, so I'm welcoming that and really looking forward to that. And then hopefully I can get back in my NBA writing groove after All-Star weekend, so after this weekend. And I can already tell you probably what's going to be on deck is my concern over these Memphis Grizzlies and Mark Gasol being out yes. indefinitely. Oh, my goodness. Because that is a huge blow to any plans that we thought we had of making the playoffs. So that will probably be my debut piece on the other side of All-Star weekend. Uh, so, you know, same old, same old, teaching yoga and acting and uh, hoping to take everything up another level in 2016. I did want to say Perfect. just one thing, though. Yeah, I just saw this note. I just saw a note that Monty Williams' wife died. Monty Williams, the former head coach of the Pelicans, and I can't remember whose yes. staff he's on now. But his wife was killed in a car accident. My goodness. And they've got five children. Oh, my goodness. Um, wow. So you'll probably read more about that when we get off the phone. But I saw that just when I was getting ready to join you. So definitely prayers out to his family yes. prayers um, and his friends family. around definitely. the league. That is a tough loss. Yeah. Really, really tough. Oh, my goodness. Roz, tell us tell us best ways to get in contact with you, um, all the places, the various places that you're writing at. And, you know, yeah, sure. where can we find you on social media? Yeah, you can find me on and on Twitter at r underscore trinity. So please come give me a follow. I love uh, love interacting with the new folks, getting some new blood in the sports conversation. And usually, all of my work you can find it there. I'm writing fitness pieces over at Rolling Out, and uh, still doing most of my sports writing for the Sports Fan Journal. And some of those uh, pieces pop up on Fox and on Yard Barker as well. So check me out on Twitter and you Twitter, and you can stay up to date with that stuff. And then follow me on Instagram. A lot of times I post my commercials or any ads that I've done on there, so people can have an opportunity to see that stuff as well. So R underscore Trinity in both places. And Ted, thanks so much. I always love when I get a chance to chat with you. One of the best hosts that I get to interact with, and I really appreciate your professionalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. Thank you for joining us. we got about 30 seconds left, but we want to close it out by giving you a round of applause. Thank you so much, Raj. We love you. <laughs> and that was Rosalind Ross who joined us. So we just want to give a quick rundown 15 seconds ago. Uh, the CEO and president of Salon Paz was on to join us, Dennis Soderberg, um, CS Keys, and, of course, the lovely Rosalind Ross. We're out of here. All the best. We'll see you next week.